And um, welcome to Bypassing Colonial Legacies. Um, whoa! Like, big claps to everyone, because we're all inside wanting to have conversations rather than being outside, and I just think that's really exciting. Um, my name is Aflo the Poet, and I will be moderating the panel today. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and also they, them. Um, I am a spoken word artist, an activist, and an academic, um, like to cross all the borders here. Um, and before we get into introducing our wonderful panelists today, just wanted to let everyone in the audience know that if you would like to leave um, during the discussion or the Q&A, please use the doors at the back. Um, and also there are QR codes scattered around, scattered around um, so that you can anonymously ask questions in the Q&A. Any other bits of housekeeping? No. So yeah, here we will be um, confronting and querying um, the legacies of colonialism. Now, I imagine colonialism to be quite rigid and straight. And so if we're going to find a way around that, the route's going to be queer. <laughs> and there might be more than one way. <laughs> so. Um, so, I would like to start with introducing our wonderful panellists. I'm going to go over here to Shiri. Hello. Uh, so, I'm Shiri Eisner. My pronouns are they, them. Uh, I'm an activist, an author. I wrote a book called Buy Notes for a Bisexual Revolution. And I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Shiri. <laughs> I also forgot to mention um, that we're also going to do brief descriptions of what we are appearing like. So I have an afro and I'm wearing a blue jumpsuit. Shiri, could you please describe yourself to me and to us all? Um, my skin looks a lot lighter than it actually is on this camera. <laughs> um, You've got a talent. <laughs> uh, I have long black hair and I have uh, pink and purple braids. Um, in my hair and I am wearing a short black dress, but you can't see it because you can only see me from the shoulders up. Thank you. Thanks, Shiri. Um, and I'll pass over this way along our panel, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Pris Nash. I am a poet, a model, and a rapper, and also an activist. And yes, also very happy to be here. My pronouns are they, them, she, her, either is fine. And I am wearing a black and green pinafore with lots of cool badges that I got today. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. Oh, this on? Hello? Yeah, OK. Hello. Uh, hi. Um, my name is Vineet Mehta. My pronouns are he, him. I am an Indian bisexual man born and raised in Southall in West London. And I am a software engineer by day, but by night. And at various other times, I am a writer and public speaker and author of Bisexual Men Exist. Um, audio description, I'm wearing black shorts and a bisexual tie-dye shirt. <laughs> I have shoulder-length hair uh, with a braid on one side and a little elephant dangly earring. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay. All right. <laughs> so my name is Tim. Pronouns he, him. Um, I am a pharmacist, digital health enthusiast, currently in my third year of my PhD. So I'm kind of like <laughs> Yeah, what am I wearing? Um, I'm wearing a pair of pale blue jeans and um, black and white, um, black and red shirt, striped shirt. And I have like locks on, and I'm pretty, I'm cute. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you guys. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> we're, all, we're all looking pretty cute. Okay, so um, I wanted to ask everybody um, an individual question before we get into more of a group discussion, because there's so much knowledge on this panel, like we can't fit it all in into the 35 minutes that we've got to discuss and the 10 minute Q&A. So you have to check them all out afterwards. But I'm going to go over to Shiri first. And Shiri, I'd, I'd like to ask you, in your book, you talk about um, monosexual privilege, and I'd love it if you could explain what that is a little bit more and 
if and how that may be linked to colonialism? Um, so basically, monosexual privileged is a term I coined to, um, to bring more attention to the axis of oppression that we experience that is separate uh, from that of gay and lesbian people and, and of trans people. Um, and, and I wanted to draw attention to the fact that society is not only built to be cishet, it's built to be cishet and mono. Um, mm -hmm. So monosexual privilege, uh, the list of, of uh, monosexual privileges describes um, a lot of the benefits um, that society gives to monosexual people with an emphasis on cishet, but also not, not excluding <laughs> cis, gay, and lesbian people. Okay. Um, and I think monosexism has a lot to do with colonialism. It is a very colonial concept. Um, originally, bisexuality was used um, in biology to describe um, species um, that don't have a clear differentiation between a male and female sex. Um, and this meaning was carried over to anthropology um, and implemented to talk about um, primitive or savage society, that being, you know, colonized societies, societies of people of color, um, to describe them as less cultured, than white people. So, so the entire concept is very, very closely linked. And of course, monosexual privilege itself is, is a lot stronger um, in the benefits that it provides to white people. Interesting. Intersections always come into play and overlap. Thank you for sharing that, Shiri. Um, I you. think that as a bi person, that wasn't necessarily something that I had considered before. This, like naming that as monosexual privilege. So thank you for that insight. I want to get into that more a bit later. Um, but again, coming over to this side of the panel again. Um, <laughs> Pris, you are a spoken word artist. I am. And I'm aware that within your work, you use research and you look back to history in order to kind of explain what's going on in the present or offer another perspective. So I guess in terms of sexuality, bisexuality more specifically, and colonialism, why do you think it's important to look back in order to inform the discussions we're having in the present? I think it's important because I'm someone who loves to learn and I think that we can learn from history for two things of what to do and what not to do. And I, you know, and I, I very much want to create a space where we can learn about the things that need to happen. So in terms of queerness, for example, like I am black British, I'm Ghanaian, bop bop. And, um, and unfortunately in Ghana, there is a, a horrible bill that is, that is being passed that's making it illegal for people to be queer, illegal for people to be trans, and just a lot of powerful things are wrapped up in that. And... It's frustrating because that is all very colonial. Gender is colonial, the binary is colonial. Before a certain demographic with certain votes showed up, there were non-binary and trans people in my home country, and I did not know this until like three, four years ago, because why would they want us to know the practices that we had? And it's, hmm, how do I say it? Yeah, I think it's important to look back and see that Queerness, bi-ness, trans-ness, like it's not a new thing. This isn't a phase as we all very much know. This isn't something that, oh, everyone's queer now, everyone's bisexual now. People have been bisexual, like in Ghana specifically in, oh, thank you. <laughs> and like Ghana specifically in the Dagari tribes, like they very much believe that like there wasn't man or woman, like gender was not a thing. They believed that everybody had feminine and masculine energy and that you know anatomy wasn't how you defined yourself it was just like your energy your spirit and i think returning back to that is such an important thing and mm. such a validating thing as well i believe 
Thanks. Yes, yes, yes. I think that really ties in with what Shiri was saying as well about why absolutely bisexual. Yeah, like, those hey, are exactly yeah. like the the cultural moments where people of color and colonized people were described as bisexual in in a way that would tie into like the idea of primitiveness and, and savagery. Mm. Links. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. Not such a smooth link. Moving on. <laughs> I would love to ask you, Vineet, um, your work around um, exposing the existence of bisexual men, I think, is so important. And again, with reference to colonialism, what does colonialism tell us about bisexual men? And how is that different from what it tells us about bisexual women? Not to be so binary. But... Yeah, I think the thing that colonialism really did when it came to bisexual men, and I think it does impact bisexual women as well, is um, the way it changed masculinity and the way that it uh, created this idea of the patriarchy and the way that the way that people interact with men and what that means. So there's a concept called phallocentrism, which is this idea that when you have sexual interactions, when you have uh, experiences or attraction to people with the penis, with a penis, uh, and it's very cisnormative in, in its idea, that alters and changes you. And so you get stuff like the, the purity culture around if women, when women have sex, they're changed, they're altered, they're deflowered. Uh, when they have sex with loads of men, then they're, they're sluts. And it's this idea of the way that masculinity has been imposed onto things. And so when it comes to bisexual men, when they have sex with someone, penetrative sex with a penis, they're robbed of their masculinity. It's taken away from them because they so, put so much power into that. Mm. And I think a lot of that comes from this colonial mindset of very traditional gender norms. And you know, these places weren't exactly gender utopias beforehand, but this is a very Western ideology of how gender is constructed and what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, and how that's so tied up in heteronormativity. And so when you get, uh, when it comes down to bisexuality, your attraction to men is what defines you. And so it's why bi women are so often seen as straight and bi men are so often seen as gay. It's because it's their interactions with the penis, it's their sex mm. and that penetrative mm. sex that defines them that marks them, that robs them of masculinity. And so bisexual men can't say that they're straight because people will go, well, no, you're gay because you've had sex with a penis. That defines you. Um, it's, it's a very Western ideology and very colonialist mm. ide ideology around how gender is constructed. It really is that point about patriarchy being so fixated on the phallus, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like whether you're being penetrated or pe pe that, that's, that is, that's what defines you, that defines your sexuality. Yes. <laughs> it's not that basic. <laughs> <sighs> and Tim. Hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, so your PhD yeah. around pharmaceuticals it's and... It's complicated. Uh, com I'm also in the final year of my PhD, so I really feel you. No, no, no. You'll see kind. Well, definitely around health. And, uh, health yeah, and um, specifically using technologies to improve chronic, inequalities. Chronic, chronic conditions in Africa. Okay. But I'm using a decolonial praxis for my work. Nice. Yeah. Finding a different way around. Um, I'm really interested in yeah. inequalities mm -hmm. in health with bisexual people, yeah. maybe queer people more broadly. Yeah. Is there any light that you can oh, share? Oh yeah, I, I would. I would like to start by saying first of all that if you use a if you use a critical lens, yeah, so look at culture in Africa, specifically my country Nigeria. Look at culture that kind of like deviates from what is supposed to be the standard monogamous Christian whatever definition of what a relationship is supposed to be like you realize that it has been grossly, significantly suppressed. And what that tells us is that um, much of what we have 
what we know today is learned or taught, if you want to say it like that, right? And there's a direct correlation between countries like Nigeria and Africa that are very, you know, biphobic, transphobic, and queerphobic, and those countries that are actually, you know, colonized. There's a direct relationship between them, right? So let's just set that as the foundation, first of all. So taking it back to years ago when I was in school, right? First of all, I'm trans. <laughs> Okay, some people didn't know that. So I, as a, experiencing as a cisgendered, <laughs> as a cisgendered bioromantic woman, because I fall under the the umbrella of the bio umbrella, like bioromantic, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it was there's just a lot of things going on because here I am being queer, here I am being bioromantic, here I am also being you no. Know, have been trans and learning how to actually provide healthcare to people who wouldn't waste time to throw me into fire or something if they knew anything about me, right? Mm -hmm. So we, first of all, we, I wasn't trained to even ask about sexuality or anything in the first place, right? And my, I, I grew up in a very, and I learned in a very hypocritical environment where everyone is preaching but not necessarily living according to what they preach. Now taking it back into practice, right? These health inequalities were very, very obvious, particularly when we talk about socioeconomic strata and systems like that, right? I worked in a, I worked in a, a HIV clinic for several months and then we could see, I could see like different categories of people coming for both PrEP and for mm -hmm. normal treatment, right? But we, you know when you see someone and you know that, yeah, you're queer, you're coming for your PrEP, but we can't have that conversation, right? So if there's anything that I know is that there is a very significant relationship between, you know, the perceptions we have because we have, we are very religious, we are very hypocritical, and that has now stemmed into how we actually, you know, deliver education, which also has affected how we practice in work, right? Mm. So I do know that if at all I had that opportunity or I was, you know, more aware or conscious of the fact that I could actually ask someone that, oh, are you a gay man? Are you a queer man? Are you bisexual? Are you having sex with a man or a woman? There are certain conversations that could actually guide the kind of care that I'm actually providing to those people. And it's sad to say that it was not existing at that time. And I wouldn't say it's actually existing now, mm -hmm. but it's like it's improving as time goes on. So yeah, that's basically my experience mm, in, in, in everything. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I think that leads us very neatly on. It's like we rehearsed this, we really didn't. Um, to, the, to the group discussion I would like to have. Everyone on the panel today is from the global majority. Woo -woo. Um, however, a lot of places in the global majority have been colonized or impacted by colonialism. We all know this, right? That's why you're here. But what I'm interested in, we all have very different lived experiences and backgrounds, and I want to have like a group discussion about what it is to be by whilst belonging to a community that has been colonized or impacted by colonialism. I don't know if anyone wants to start. <laughs> okay, maybe I should I should yeah, start. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> here. You know that in my country, people hate bisexual, especially bisexual women. There is this thing about you know, you can be straight, you can just get married to a man and live your life and, you know, keep your queer fantasies. In fact, there are even WhatsApp groups for women who want to get married and then find, like, side chicks and babies, you know, <laughs> girlfriends on the side. That right? sounds smart. That's the way <laughs> But it's great. unfair. But, like, based on, my, <laughs> well, based on my experience, because I, it's, it's, it's tricky because I am biromantic, but not necessarily bisexual. So even for me, it was kind of like, it was kind of like a struggle because first of all, everyone, nobody wants to be beaten and stigmatized and you know, sent to jail and stuff. So I, I think for most of us, where we come from, we have that period of our lives where we're trying to be straight. So in my trying to be straight and knowing that, oh, I can actually have feelings for men, but why don't I see them in a sexual way? 
that was very, very complicated and difficult right. for me to navigate, even with the men that I put through trauma during that period of my life. Do you understand? And then extrapolating that to, you know, real life settings and stuff, it's even, it was even hard to even, you know, come out and say, hey, I'm a I'm bi I'm bi romantic. Sorry, so, what? That, that, yeah, <laughs> what? Like, like it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense to people who do not necessarily experience it. And there's this kind of erasure because they assume that because you can have feelings or whatever for either genders or either sexes, you, or all of the genders and sexes, sorry, that probably you could like force yourself to just be normal in quote. And oops, I mean, now I'm trans. <laughs> no, but like, now beautiful I mean, trans. I'm putting my face yeah, the face of the expression. The beautiful woman. It is that, like, that's erasure, yeah. though, right? <laughs> it's the, oh, well, if you can do both, then don't do that one. Yeah. Exactly. Like, truly, if you have choice, just don't. Yeah. But I, I want to I wanna hear what, if anyone else wants to. Throw anything in. I was going to say it's it's a very similar experience being part of the Indian diaspora. Mm. Is it's this idea of you you have a choice so use it and pick that side. I remember when I came out to my mom, it was very much like, but you're still interested in women, so maybe you just go do that. That's fine, right? Just go do that one. And I was like, that's not how love works. I I can't just choose who I love like that. If I fall in love with someone and they don't happen to be a woman, sorry, I don't know what to tell you. Um, but that was very much the encouragement, and I feel like it's, it's so interesting the way that the Indian diaspora works when it comes to queerness is that it's so embedded with colonialism because they don't see queerness as part of our culture when it always was. Mm -hmm. And queerness and fluidity was always such a part of our culture. You see statues of Hindu gods and goddesses, you see them where they're like half man, half woman. You see the fluidity, you see how our um, hijra, which is like part of the trans community, was celebrated before colonialism, and it's so much has changed since then. And the Indian diaspora are so pinned on what they think their culture is when they left India, and they bring that into the diaspora setting. And so they're so obsessed with this idea of, of shunning queerness because they think it's a white thing, they think it's assimilation. Mm -hmm. Even though so many of them are desperate to assimilate, mm -hmm. let's not talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Let me not call it my community, but they're desperate for it. Um, they don't want that part because they, they're so scared about talking about sexuality, they're so scared about talking about fluidity and talking about sex at all. And so when it comes to queerness it's very much like with, with gay it's oh that's unavoidable but with bi it's well you can you can shove them down the right route and so that is encouraged because ultimately that could mean that your queerness kind of just disappears mm. it's it's that idea of like i remember my parents didn't want me to tell anyone else they didn't want me to talk about it publicly sorry <laughs> <laughs> They didn't want me to do any of that because they, they wanted to make sure that this was something that was hidden um, because they were, they're so worried about losing touch with their culture, not realizing that this is all just white supremacy and colonialism. Wow, yeah. Chris. Yeah, very, very similar stories to both of these wonderful people here. Um, so, yeah, Ghana, ha, 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 what a place. Beautiful place, <laughs> beautiful people. Um, but Ghana now, I say now because history is important, is a very Christian country, mm. and I come from a very religious family. I never came out, I never felt the need to co come out, just because, just like, <laughs> be serious. <laughs> And especially with like uh, like somewhere from the African diaspora that is like so woven with Christianity and in the Bible you can't be gay. God says it's a bad thing. The Bible's been written and rewritten many, 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 many times, yeah. <laughs> and there are many things that have been left out. And you know, for a lot of my life, I felt this internal struggle of want to have this faith that I've grown up in, but everything about it says that I can't be myself, but just having to make peace with the fact that, yeah, like I said, history is important. Like, it's like that now, 
but it wasn't always. And we can use history to see what to do and what not to do. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just, just making peace with the fact that it doesn't have to be the way that everybody says it is, because right. who made these rules? Yeah. Right, you exactly. Know? It's like there's that narrative of don't drink the soy milk, that the white people, they're trying to make you gay. <laughs> don't drink it. <laughs> Or like all these, like that. There's these, there's these undercover things that are happening to try and like demasculate yeah. men within the black and brown communities yeah. in the global majority. And I really want to. I, I, I couldn't quite say it to my grandma, but I did want to tell her like, it's. They told you to do the opposite. Like it, that. That's how colonialism worked. It said no, don't do that. You have to follow this straight line. You have to follow this one truth, this one way of being, and actually what we're trying to do is return to that, rather than threatening the way that our communities have continued to exist through so much brutality. I mean, yeah. let's even talk about how did Christianity get to those countries, and the violent that, acts, that's a very the violent acts of Christianity in those countries, and forcing it onto the people. Let's talk about that part. Mm. We can. <laughs> we absolutely can. But I would also like to go to Shiri to ask for their perspective. You're in Tel Aviv right now, right? And, um, near I, enough. Near enough, <laughs> okay. Um, I, yeah, well, how is it being by in a colonized community as colonialism is happening in the present moment? Yeah, it's, it's complicated. Um, so I'll say uh, I'm Mizrahi, which means I'm Arabic Jewish. Um, so here in Israel, I am both colonized and colonizer, and the Mizrahi community has a very, very complicated role in maintaining the occupation, apartheid, and ethnic cleansing against the Palestinians. Um, but wait, I forgot the question, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, um, it to was, so what many what is it things. like to, to be bisexual and, and Mizrahi? So um, I actually really connected with the things that Vanit said about this like enormous chasm between knowing our legacies uh, of queerness of, in, in culture and history and the, the current reality that colonialism has instilled in colonized countries. And, and it's the same way in the Middle East. Um, in, in a lot, actually, in a lot of uh, colonized and formerly colonized countries, um, the law against homosexuality is the same one. Uh, section uh, 175 of British colonial law which is still in place in, in a lot of countries where homosexuality is currently criminalized. And yet, when, um, if and when homosexuality is decriminalized in these countries, I remember when, it, when uh, homosexual marriage was made legal in India, mm. and there were so many, I saw so many people across social media going, oh, that's so brilliant, like in the UK, being like, oh, that's so great, that's so brilliant, that's so... When, without the understanding that it came from yeah. this yeah. tiny island in the first place and that that is the legacy that we've left behind. Yeah, yeah and, and even the fact that like in a lot of Orientalist and colonial writings, um, the Middle East and East Asia were imagined as, um, as bisexual, uh, as a way, like I said before, as, as a way to, to paint them as primitive, as savage, and as a way to justify colonial rule. Um, so in, in that way, straightness was, and cishetness, of course, was considered part of the legacy that like white people had to instill it as part of the white man's burden. Mm. It was part of the culture that they were meant to impart on us. Um, and, and actually, I have a really good story about like a tidbit that I found. Okay. Um, <laughs> specifically, uh, so when I was doing my BA, I was studying Islamic art. Um, and my professor brought a poem uh, written in, I think, 12th or 13th century Iraq. 
um, and these centuries in Europe are considered um, the Middle Ages, but in the Muslim world, they are called the Golden Age. Um, so it was like a period of, of a lot of cultural creation and a lot of, um, a, a lot of writings were preserved then, a lot of academic uh, fields were being developed, like they developed mathematics and astronomy and things like that. Um, and that poem was discussing the ideal woman. Um, and until then, it has, also has to do with like the way that white beauty standards have influenced me because I have like this really hourglass shaped body and I always thought like it looked wrong because I was looking up to those standards. But that poem described a woman who looked exactly like me like down to like long hair thick enough that your comb can can get lost in. <laughs> which is hey. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Can, and and can we have the poem? Says, I want to share. I want to. I need to hear that poem. I sure. wish I had it. I wish I had it. I'll email you. I'll email you. Mm -hmm. Do. <laughs> anyway, so one of the things that were specified about that woman who uh, was like the uh, the ideal of, of beauty and desire is that she's bisexual. The poem says she likes girls as, as well as men. Aww. And that's just, I mean, and it's complicated <laughs> because on one hand, it's like, okay, bisexuality was being acknowledged. That's great, but also, oh, wow, fetishization of bisexual women goes on <laughs> with that. Yeah. I, I like it's to real. To that. It's real. Thank you. Thank you, Shiri. Yeah. Um, Wow. We've only got a few more minutes until we get into our Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, and I really wanted to just touch upon um, what, take, what learnings can we take from more ancestral and indigenous understandings around bisexuality or sexuality as a whole, this more fluid ways of being. What can we take from that? Maybe take isn't the right word, actually. Yeah. <laughs> what can we learn from that? Um, I mean, I honestly think exactly what you just said is that there is fluidity in the way that we exist. Mm. That I think our, our world, our world, the Western world, is very obsessed with categorization. Mm -hmm. And categories and labels are really useful in a lot of different ways to help people find each other and find community. But ultimately, where we fall short in the Western world is that we become so obsessively, like, obsessed with the idea that we need to be in this category and we can't exist outside of it. Mm. And it's forgetting that these boxes aren't neat little squares that you do use when you're packing up your house. These are big, vast, open entities that can mm. exist in so many different ways. Mm. There's no one way to be bisexual or pansexual or queer. There's no one way to be trans. There's so many different existences within that. And I think it's about the taking that fluidity for ourselves and really allowing ourselves to express ourselves as a, an individual and as a whole person rather than this like neat box of labels. I mean, mm. we all do it. We all be like, oh, I'm a blah, blah, blah. But it's, we're so much more than that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, well, it's great to have those signifiers or uh, labels to realize that like you're not alone in how you feel all these boxes then become some sort of grid, right? Yeah, right? And then we're really like boxed. Or there's other parts of the grid that you can't access when actually humans aren't box shaped in the first place. Mm -hmm. So why are you trying to <laughs> like be messy? <laughs> Spread across yes, the boxes. Be messy. Yeah. Yeah. That's... All right. For me, I think I want to talk on behalf of, you know, probably Africans in diaspora, or even if you're in your country, where you might not necessarily you know, know the nitty gritty of your culture. You might not know what happens. So I want to talk about that specifically from um, a Christian point of view. Because before we, first of all, in summary, be yourself, right? But what, <laughs> what I want to emphasize is that we, it, it might be a struggle before, because before we get there, we have to deconstruct and then view what colonialism has done and then what we deem as authentically African before we even know, okay, this is what we are talking about, mm. right? And if you cannot 
go back to say this is what is authentically African. Because why I'm saying this is because I'm I'm Ishakiri, right? I'm from a minor tribe in Nigeria, and I don't really know anything about my tribe. Most of what I know is purely religious, and what is being used against me is also based on the Bible, right? So um, this is for those Christians out there. I would like to say that first of all, you're not a sin. And everything is just buried in patriarchy and misogyny because let me just bust your brain a little bit. <laughs> if you go to the one of the most popular scriptures that is used against us, right? That is in Leviticus, man shall not sleep by a woman as big man is doing this, this. The thing is, as someone who loves to read and deconstruct every single thing that I'm reading, right? That scripture, that verse, that passage, that Leviticus book is very specific. It tells man, woman, uncle that it's very specific. But when it comes to the area of that particular verse on homosexuality, people just like to cherry pick what suits them. Nobody does what is above, don't eat shellfish. No one does what is beneath, <laughs> don't keep curled hair. But that man shall not sleep with man. Like, to even think that women were so insignificant that Talking about women sleeping with women in the Old Testament wasn't even mentioned. Mm -hmm. So it's all, you know, wrapped up in how do we make men mm -hmm. look like masters and all of that. But so even, sorry, I want to bust your brain for a sec <laughs> with that line. And going back to what Chris mentioned about there's been so many um, translations and rewritings of the Bible. From my understanding, it was man shall not lay with boy. Yeah. Oh, that even oh, worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even worse. It was about pedophilia. Yes, it was. <laughs> but, there was worse. but this is a whole nother. <laughs> yeah, conversation. <laughs> um, and I'm really so. I feel like we have so much more there, to say. Lot, but yeah. it is getting into our final ten minutes, and so I want to open up to Q and A. Q and A. Okay. Um, if there are hello. Um, Simon, yeah, are you going to be going around with the... Oh, it's okay, you can stay seated if you want. We will bring a mic, or you can come up. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's so if you have a question that you want to ask, is it best to text it in? Or um, come to the you mic. can choose. So the way we do it is we alternate between people who just put their hands up, and you can also anonymously submit questions online. Um, so I will uh, start with somebody who has their hand up, and then we will go to someone who else online, and vice versa. Great. So you Thank can you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this lovely talk. It's been such an insightful afternoon. I wanted to speak to two things. Uh, one being that while we speak about the traders who came to our lands, we don't speak about uh, the pot-bellied Brahmin or the uh, traders, the brown people who allowed for uh, these people to subvert and to take the stories of um, tribal and uh, oppressed caste people, and we don't talk about caste as much, uh, and we, talk, uh, we don't talk about how uh, they abetted colonization to spread its roots deeper. Mm. That's one point, and then that's like in the past, and then now if you're looking at how right-wing organizations are doing the same work and are very, very organized in the way they're trying to squish out by identities, trans identities, and like, what could we do? I mean, it's, it's really amazing to be in a room together, but like, uh, what do we do going from here? So I was just curious if you all had any thoughts. I want to tag in on this straight away, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, I want to go to your first point to say, one of colonialism's strongest tools is divide and conquer, yeah. and it will constantly pit us against one another. Um, and while there may be differences, like it, it, we can't put ourselves in that position as to whether or not you would protect yourself or another. However, I think that this also plays into the queer community. How, we, how are bi people excluded from the queer community? How are we pushed out of but like either side, you know? Um, that again, it feels like divide and conquer. It feels like that's someone else telling us that we shouldn't all be together. But look at us, we're all in here together. And so leading on to your second point, like how do we move through that is power and unity. Yeah. Like it is showing them that we will not split ourselves, we will multiply and we will come together 
because we know what's right and there's more of us. Yeah. So, and uh, if, I must, if, if I must add, I really, I really like what we're doing because we also have to empower ourselves and also, you know, inform people in the queer community who are not necessarily knowledgeable about this because there's still people who feel inadequate and who don't mm. feel like they belong. And if we still have those colonial mentalities, yeah. we're not even helping ourselves as well. So, yeah, I like it. Yeah. I, um wanted to give a, I guess, a little story is um, my sister went to visit Goa like, like 10 years ago or something. And um, her experience of Goa were really eye-opening because when she was there, um, as, a, as an Indian person, they're very excited to see another Indian person who's from the UK. And one of the things that they always ask is, what is your surname? Because surname is intrinsically tied to caste. And when she said her surname, they got very excited because my surname is something that is tied to the Brahmin caste and if you are in a certain demographic, which we weren't. So uh, she, she said to them, my surname's Metta, and they were like, oh, you're a Brahmin, which is the highest caste, and got very excited over her. And then they asked if she's Gujarati, and she said, no, Punjabi, and suddenly they went very deflated <laughs> because that is not a Brahmin caste in Punjabi. Um, there's a lot to be said around uh, caste systems and exactly what you said, it's around divide and conquer. There's a lot of stuff in India which I'm only slightly aware of because I'm, I'm part of the diaspora. It's not as much of a thing here, but I know it does exist. Um, and it's, it's quite uncomfortable because you get stuff like, uh, you can only marry certain castes, you get stuff like honor killings because if you marry outside your caste, and it's, it's so much about, it honestly feels like it's trying to replicate and assimilate into whiteness because it's, it's the higher caste you are. You see it in, even with stuff like uh, Rishi Sunak and Priti Patel. It's, it's all about this idea of trying to become white, which is exactly what I was trying to say earlier. I was like, I don't, let's not boast my ethnicity too much, but it is. There's certain things that they go, well, that's white, we're not going to do that, whilst at the same time aspiring to it. Um, and it's realising that whiteness is not going to be your saviour. Getting into whiteness and assimilating into that is not going to be your saviour because ultimately they still see you as a brown person. And when, when push comes to shove, you're under the bus. When push comes to shove, you're going to take the fall. And so it's about power and unity, for sure. Anything else to add on that, Sherry or Chris? It's so like good and interesting that you mentioned like Rishi Sunak and like Pretty Patel the demon, um, <laughs> because that's that's exactly like what that is. Like you just have like, and what's what's the one who always has the bad braids? Kemi, Kemi something. Anyway, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. Kemi with the bad hair. Kemi with the bad hair. <laughs> But like, that, that's exactly it though. It's just like black and brown faces for white supremacy. And yeah. like all Pick we- me. Yes, Pick yes. Me. I mean, yeah, exactly. Let me not- <laughs> but... If you want to come to the after party roasting session, I'll be outside. <laughs> There's a cacao, it's going to be a roast. <laughs> um, Shiri, would you like to add anything? Yeah, um, the things Vanit said really reminded me about my family um, and, and the way that assimilation into whiteness is, is something that so often characterizes colonized populations. And especially here in Israel, where uh, participation in the occupation and, and apartheid and ethnic cleansing has been one of the main engines for Mizrahis to get ahead in life. Um, so one particular point of pride for my family was that my grandfather had a very active role in, in uh, establishing um, one of the military units that operates within Palestinian society, um, where soldiers are disguised as Palestinians in order to sabotage Palestinian society from inside. I think while we can make our lightheartedness 
about this conversation. It's really important to like base it back in that reality of the damage and brutality and the loss and genocide that has come from this separation and this lack of fluidity and that moving forwards, what can we do to embrace that fluidity within ourselves, but also to, to encourage that to be the way of being for everybody. Um, thank you for sharing, Shiri. Thank you. Um. Um, yes, I will read one out from online, and we have five minutes left. Um, oh. <laughs> I know, I wish we had hours. <laughs> um, this is from a queer man that runs a black men's mental health group in London. Big and up, amazing. <laughs> and they ask, how can we keep a safe space for diverse communities while educating the world around us on how to respect us? That, that, that's gonna be that's hard. <laughs> uh, anybody wanna go fair? <laughs> I think so like with a lot of stuff that I do with poetry, I, I use a lot of like research and it's 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 lots of things, but I like to talk about political stuff and social justice stuff. One, because people listen to me because I'm gorgeous. Two, because <laughs> it's important to be using your platform for like important things and I think things like poetry, music, creativity, like that could be a safe and accessible way to engage in what you're trying to say because mm. everybody's activism looks different. Not everybody wants to take to the streets, not everybody wants to set things on fire. I think they should, that's just me. <laughs> but, you know, it, every, you know, and everybody like, you know, responds to different things. So I think maybe, Hmm, how do I say it? <laughs> yeah, just finding like alternate ways a that- A queer route. A queer, <laughs> wavy, fun, interesting yeah. way. Like how would you like to engage with things? Like how would you like to be taught about something? That's how I like to approach things. How would I like to receive this information? How mm. would I like to create a safe space? And then yeah. go forth and do the thing. Like to add to that, I feel like obviously there's power in numbers and that's not to say that you have to be born setting things on fire, but you can like make a change in that little place that you find yourself. When I think of safety, I think about it from the health perspective. I'm thinking about mental health, I'm thinking about physical safety, I'm thinking about conversion therapy, I'm thinking about mm. things that happen in those spaces that are unsafe for us outside that. So I think that there's a lot of work that has to be done in decolonizing our religious institutions and our academic structures because most of this is tied down to this is what the white people said we should behave as. So if we can change the way we think, maybe it's just one step towards you know, a better future for all of us. And if you find yourself in, the, in healthcare, be the voice there. If you find yourself in church, be the voice there. Mm -hmm. In the club, be the voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to again give a small case study, and the case study is where we are today by Pride. Um, in 2017, Pride in London had no bi groups marching in Pride. In 2018, a lot of the bi community got together and they created floats and all of this stuff to make sure that they were present there. And they have been doing that, but realizing that they are putting in all of this work and not receiving any of the benefit in kind, mm. being that they are still marginalized even within that space. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing that I always want to warn people, and it's exactly why Bi Pride exists, is the most important thing to do is create the safety that you can, create the space that you can, create a place where those people can go, rather than spending all of your time and energy and letting these people take emotional labor for basically nothing um, to change their space and improve their space when mm -hmm. ultimately these people, a lot of them benefit from white supremacy, so they're not going to be dismantling it. And you can try and work with them and try and fight that, but ultimately your time is better spent making stuff like this, yes. where you can then have those have that safety for the people who are under the pressure of white supremacy. If you have limited resources, focus on your own first yeah. and then see if you can reach outwards. Yeah. Because ultimately you see it with the bi community and they've, they keep spending energy, they have been spending energy trying to work with all of these groups 
and seeing that they just actually don't care. And, and so, so yeah. they boycott. So they boycott, and rightly so. Yeah. If you don't understand it, if you're not an ally, mind your business. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to add anything? Uh, I actually didn't hear the question, so if you could repeat it, that would be great. Um, so there was someone who was running a black men's mental health group and was asking about how to make it a safer space. Yeah. No. Thank you. So how can we ensure um, Unfortunately, that, I didn't hear any of that. <laughs> how, how can we ensure that the, safe is, that, that the space is safe, but that we're also able to educate the wider community in this context, black men, about these issues within the group? Uh, yeah, so my own method has always been to create ripples um ripples. so like i yeah so so that when i write in the air. Uh, sorry <laughs> 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 so my, my main form of activism these days is writing and, and when i write i want to imagine the best world that is possible for us to fully make people understand and what we deserve and all the ways that society needs to the change in the most radical way mm. and, and from there it ripples out mm -hmm. like once you get people to to hear those words and to understand these principles they move out and ripple across a lot like a, a much wider um audience i guess yeah <laughs> in lack of a better term um there's so, that power in like, unity, but then also like we always the need to remember that, yeah, like that that we have to imagine the best world possible and settle for absolutely nothing less. <laughs> absolutely. And um, I can't believe it, but we've come to the end of our time together on Yay. this panel, and what a beautiful point to end on, like. Everybody can. <laughs> but thank you so much to our wonderful panelists, excellent contributions, everybody for being here. And I, I stuck on that word ripple because it's one that I love myself. And let's all continue to spread ripples. I think what colonialism tells us is that change has to be big. It doesn't. Big change comes from small changes. So if we all keep doing our little ripples, we're going to see big change. Woo! Yay! Yay! <laughs> this is good.